This video is specific advice for families in recovery. We're going to talk about the 10 things plus a bonus that you really need to stop saying to your loved one. Now, it's not because any of these things are bad. In fact, all of the things we're going to tell you are very natural and I'm almost certain that you've been saying them or have said them or at least been thinking them. It's just that they're not productive. And as you know, this channel is all about helping you understand the psychology of addiction so that you can stay five steps ahead of it. And honestly, it's all pretty predictable. So we know if you do or say these 10 things that I'm about to tell you, that it's really not going to get you anywhere and a lot of times can take you in the absolute wrong direction. If you're new to this channel, I'd like to invite you to subscribe and I'll make sure you understand addiction backwards and forwards and that you are always five steps ahead of it. If you got a person in your family with a substance use disorder, probably there's a little chaos going on in your house, right? I would say a lot. A lot of chaos. This video is all about the 10 things that family members, parents, spouses, whoever, need to stop saying immediately, right? Yeah. Because these things are like counterproductive. They're not helpful. They're probably going to damage a relationship. What are the other reasons why they shouldn't say these things? Um, you could just make that person feel bad about themselves. And honestly, a lot of them are excuses to go drink or get high in my book. Like when I was looking at this list and mm -hmm. like thinking back to when I was actively using, mm -hmm. um, I would have used a lot of this as an excuse. Oh my to, gosh, that's such a valid point. I can't believe she said that. I'm about to get drunk now. Right, because you know? I think the most enabling things that, the, that families can do is not the money. It's playing the bad cop mm -hmm. because that makes the person feel justified mm -hmm. to go use. They're just like, forget it. You know, and then they say, screw it, and they go out and use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... My name's David McNeese, and I'm with Greenville Transitions, a founder here, um, and I've been working with men that struggle with substance use disorder uh, for about six years now, and I've worked with plenty of them. And I'm Amber Hollingsworth, a Master Addiction Counselor and founder of Hope for Families Recovery Center. And so this is the this is our top 10 list of things you should stop saying. Now, there's a bonus at the end, so if you watch the whole thing, there's a bonus one. As we were talking about this... <laughs> We're at Greenville Transitions, which is a sober living place. We're having this conversation, making the video. And one of the guys here was telling us, we were talking to the guys and we were saying, hey, what do you think should be on this list? And, <laughs> and one of the guys was like, oh, I got your whole list right here. Yeah, you Let me see just my mom's text, text messages. messages. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to call out some of these things of what not to say. And then Amber's going to put a little spin on it, maybe a way to reword it. Or give you some alternatives or what to do instead. Yeah. Okay. So here we go with number one. We've got, have you been drinking? Who, me? Yeah, of you. Of course not. <laughs> I always say, don't ask the question, like, have you been drinking or have you been using or are you high? Because the person's going to lie to you immediately. Like, it's a reflex. And here's what I say. If you live in the house with this person and your gut says they're messed up, they're messed up. Your gut is going to tell you pretty much straight. And you may not know exactly what, but you know something's up. And if you just come right out and say, have you been drinking? Are you high? They're going to tell you no. And then you're going to be really mad. You're going to be even madder that they lied to you than the fact that they used. So don't set yourself up to be lied to. Yeah. And again, you know, going back to the days when I was using, I would have just been like, did my mom really just ask me that? How I'm about to go dare get messed her. up now. Right. I'm going to go buy a 24 pack right now. Oh, I'm drinking now. <laughs> yeah. And so it sets the person up to be a victim. It gives them another excuse to get to go use and you've set yourself up to be lied to. So in general, I tell families like, if you have the gut feeling that something's up, then just say, hey, like I'm thinking you've been drinking or you look like you've been drinking. Just make a statement mm -hmm. versus a question. And you may even want to wait until they're not intoxicated. Like, if you think they're like really intoxicated, just wait because you, mm -hmm. you really aren't going to get anywhere if you're dealing with someone that's like acutely intoxicated. Yeah. You can say, yesterday you came home, you've been drinking. Like if you say it and they weren't, they'll tell you. <laughs> I like the concerned approach. Of yeah. Like, hey, I'm concerned that you're drinking again. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that? And another way you can do it is to say, and this is kind of like uh, a Brene Brown thing, the story I'm telling myself. And so sometimes I'll tell families, if you think it and you're worried you're going to be offended, say, like, look, I know I'm like, the crazy, hyper-vigilant mother, wife, husband, 
but my head is going crazy telling me you've been drinking. Like, I know I'm probably being crazy. Like, convince me you're not. Like, you can say it like that. Yeah. If you really think that maybe you're like, you know, you're hypersensitive or maybe you're jumped to a conclusion, say that because it makes the person less offensive. Mm -hmm. I do that a lot do around you? here. Yeah. What do you, how do you say it? I mean, with different things, I'll just take that approach of like doubting myself first because it makes them less offensive, kind of takes the guard down. So. Leaves room for error. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So number two. Did you go to a meeting? Oh, good one. Why do you think they shouldn't ask that? Again, for me, it's just like one of those things like, oh, I'll show them. You know, back when I was using a course, mm -hmm. I would have gone to that mentality. Um, and two, it's like not their business. It, I feel like... Those two questions set the dynamic up immediately like boss and subordinate or mm -hmm. probation officer and parolee or like I'm the good one and you're in trouble. I don't know. It, it sets the dynamic up in a like I'm over you kind of way, which immediately puts a person on the defensive. Mm -hmm. You know, like principal's office kind of situation. Yeah, definitely. Right. So I think if you worded that a little different to say like... You know, how are the meetings going for you? Yeah. Or do you like your meetings or what's your favorite meeting or do you, ha are there any of them that you really don't like? Like ask something out of curiosity. Like you really care. Like, how's it going? Do you hate them? Do you like them? Like mm -hmm. ask something out of curiosity. But the thing I usually say about it is if someone's going to meetings, they usually bring it up on their own. Yeah. And if they're not actively bringing it up, that's a pretty good clue that they're not going. Yeah. Cause they usually want you to know. Oh, they want everyone to know. They want yeah. to tell they're like, Oh, at my meeting today, now. they just, it's almost like name dropping. Yeah. You know, they like drop it in there. So if they're not saying it, there's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to ask it. Okay. So number three, we've got, what did you talk about in your counseling session? Oh my gosh. I see so many like husbands. I see all these like alcoholic dudes. One of the first things I prep them for them say, listen, when you go home from the session, your wife is going to either say, and if she doesn't say, she's going to be thinking. What did you talk about in your session? Yeah. So I have to. Did like, you talk about me? That's yeah. a, that's a big part of their worry. Yeah, it is because I think especially for married people, it's weird. Mm -hmm. You know, especially if it's like your husband is going to talk to some other woman, and it's like, are you talking about me? And even kids, like parents, worry like, what are they saying about me? If it's a kid and parents, they're probably saying crappy stuff about you. But don't worry, we don't believe it. So <laughs> don't worry about it. We know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say as an alternative way to approach that? I think. Usually there's two things families are really after with that question. They're worried that you're talking about them because it does feel weird to think, oh, mm -hmm. even if it's not even like addiction counseling, it's just like your spouse or your kid's going to counseling and it's a worry that you have. So they're either worried about that or they're just wondering if it's working. Yeah. It's not even so much like, I want to know everything you said. It's more of like, hey, is this working? Are you getting anything out of it? Like, and so I think that's a better question to ask. Yeah. What do you I think agree. about counseling? Like, is that Amber? Is she any good? Like, what do y'all do? Like, you don't have to say, yeah. like, they don't want all the details. They just want to know, is it helpful, really? Yeah. So say that. Awesome. Let's move on to four. All right. Why did you use? Oh. Or why did you drink? This one's especially happens after a relapse. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big one then. And man, is it like, that's a tough one to hear for someone that did the using or did the drinking, I would know. What are I'm you made. thinking? Like if you've had a relapse and the loved one says like, why did you drink? Why did you use? Why did you get higher? Whatever. Like what goes through your head? I mean, my first response would be to play victim and just blame it on like, because I have a problem. Do you not understand all that I'm going through? What's wrong mm -hmm. with me as a person? Do you know how fast my brain is working and the anxiety? So I would start pointing fingers in other places, I guess. So they could be a victim of the question, mm -hmm. like you're saying, or they could use something else. Like I'm just too stressed out at work or, you know, you're on my case. You know, they're going to have some kind of victim statement and you don't want to like in counseling, you never want to put someone in a position to say something opposed to what you want them to think. Because it's like, if you make them say it, it gets even more ingrained in their head. Yeah. I mean, if you had, if you know that they used, I would, the approach that comes to my mind is like, hey, how can we support you around this? Like, mm -hmm. do we need to increase counseling? Do we need to like look into sober living options mm -hmm. or, um, you know, again, it's coming out of a place of concern, not like a, a boss or someone it's just over you. changing that dynamic, yeah, and right. I think that's the deal with most of these questions is like when you approach it from legitimate concern, it just comes across in a much better way to mm -hmm. the person. And sometimes, depending on what happened in the relapse or how it came out, I usually try to find some like silver lining in the situation. Even if it's a little something, it's sort of the opposite of what I said before. You don't want them to say something negative that you don't want them to think. So don't make something say, so don't make someone say something you don't want them to think. Mm -hmm. Like 
if you want them to think something though, you can sort of say, but you know what, I'm really glad you're admitting it or you're getting, you're getting a hold of it really quick or you seem to have a lot of insight into it. You can shift the thinking by finding something. Yeah. You know, at least we called it before you hit a bottom. Find something positive in that. And that will, even if they're not thinking that, it will trigger them to think that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So going to five. Do you love drugs more than this family? <laughs> what is the alcoholic thinking when they get asked that? Because that's a Ooh. super common one. Yeah. Man, I don't even know. That's a tough one. But it... Are they ever? Are you ever thinking like, yeah, I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did think that before. Yeah. Especially, you might not have thought it, but when she got asked that question, it yeah, makes you defensive makes you... and then you do think. Like, you're like, you know what? I think I do. Yeah. 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 My best friend. Right. Drugs and alcohol. Right. <laughs> It's way funner than you are. <laughs> yeah. I think when someone uses us not what they're thinking, though, they may think mm -hmm. that thought defensively when you ask the question, but that's not why someone is using. Yeah. The thing that thinking is, they're thinking, I can, I'm not hurting anyone else, I'm hurting myself. They're thinking that, or they're thinking, I'm just going to do it this one time, and it's not going to hurt anybody but me, or they're not going to know. They're telling themselves some kind of lie that whatever they're doing isn't going to bleed over and affect the other people somehow they have a fantasy they can do it without hurting everybody else yeah. so in their mind it's not a question of either or and in yeah. the family's mind it's a either this or that yeah i mean honestly thinking about it a little more at first i would have been defensive and secondly i would have just gotten really down on myself and internalized that and say mm -hmm. wow like man what is my problem like why do i love these drugs more than my family and you know when i'm not receiving any help i would have that would have made me want to use more to mm -hmm. cover up those feelings of depression and you know what comes with that i just say like your addiction will play whatever it needs to play like the first sort of card it'll play is it'll play something like you're a grown-ass man like mm. you can do what you want that's what you're mm. and then once you do it and then you feel bad about it like what you're saying then it starts telling you the the next thing your disease will tell you is like you're a sorry low down psychic crap your family would be better if you just left them like it's just telling yeah. you any lie to try to get you to use and that's why i think understanding the psychology of the addict is so important if you as a family member can understand what's going to trigger what thought that's what these videos are all about you can circumvent you can get five steps ahead of the disease but these things are pretty predictable i yeah. think like if you say this they're gonna think that yeah almost immediately mm -hmm. what's, what's our next one so six um i mean it's kind of close to number five but don't you care about your future family or career mm -hmm. um, like are you willing to just throw all of that away for drugs and i think you said you hear that more with like a spouse or mm -hmm. yeah and and i think that goes back to in the family's mind it's a you're choosing this which means you're not choosing this it's a one or the other and that's usually on some level truth mm -hmm. like you really in the long run you can't have both but the addict or alcoholic in their mind, they're trying to have both. Yeah. They're not they're not thinking, hey, if I smoke all this weed, I'm not gonna have a career. Yeah. Like they're telling themselves, like, oh, I'm gonna do it. It's part of that self denial thing mm -hmm. that's happening. I can make this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, number seven, have you deleted the contacts off of your phone or social media? And I feel like this one's more popular for like the parents oh, yeah. over the kid, you know, trying to control and also just trying to control their friend groups in general. Like, hey, Jimmy's doing really well. You should hang out with him more. Or like, Susie, she's not doing so hot. So maybe you should just steer clear of her. So watch that. Watch controlling the the contacts. Mm -hmm. What What's the... What's the person thinking when the family member says that to him? Oh, I'm just going against it. It's like eye roll. Immediately in my head, it's like, yeah, like again, immediately it's, it's like, like. You're trying to play the boss of me and my life, and mm -hmm. I'll show you. That's the mentality that I would take over a statement like that. Like, right. Have you deleted those contacts? Have you stopped hanging out with Julie or whatever it is? Mm -hmm. It's that I'll show you mentality, and I'll hang out with who I want to. You're not the boss of me. To me, it goes back to that, like, trying to control the problem externally because you think, oh, it's this one bad friend, it's that girlfriend, it's that one bad coworker, and you can run that person off, but there's going to be another one and another one and another one. Mm -hmm. You cannot control this problem externally. And I know it's hard because you think, oh, my gosh, that one boyfriend, he's just like, he's the reason for all this, so I get rid of him. But it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And for all you know, your loved one is the ringleader, you know? like, <laughs> And usually that's the case with the ones we see. The families always think, oh, it's that other one, but it's yours. Yeah. So running the friend off, <laughs> not going to do you any good. 
So moving on to number eight, we have scare tactics. Oh. And I'll let you cover this one more. I hate scare tactics. Yeah. I didn't have much experience with this. Oh, your family didn't do scare tactics? Not really. Not too much. Families will actually call and try to do scare tactics through me, like via me. Yeah. They'll call me and be like, Amber, did you tell him that smoking weed can do this to your lungs? You know, they'll like... Yeah. They'll be doing it at home, and then they'll want me to I definitely get it at work. I don't okay. think my mom did that so much. Scare tactics just don't work. It's just a logical thing because you're thinking, oh, if they knew this bad thing that could happen to them, they wouldn't do it. That's what addiction is. It's mm -hmm. I'm doing it despite the fact I know that these bad things can happen to me. And early on, you to yourself, you think, oh, yeah, that could happen. That would never happen to me. Mm -hmm. And then later on, when you're really addicted, you think, I don't really care. Like, it's worth the risk. Yeah. So it just doesn't mm -hmm. work either way. And if you get to a really bad place, it's like, I want something bad to happen to me. So bring it on. Just yeah. in a slow, steady way. Like, it, you know, I wanted to smoke cigarettes. I wanted to take pills because... You know, I wanted something to happen. I wanted this madness to stop. It's kind of like a, in the end stages, people get to what I call like a passive suicidality. So it's not like an yeah. active plan necessarily, but it's just like a, I'm living reckless. Like, I don't really care if I don't wake up tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. speed this process up. So, I know I definitely got to that, that state of mind. Yes. All right. So number nine, we have comparisons. Like okay. to siblings, to friends. We kind of brought that up with controlling contacts mm -hmm. but i mean we've definitely seen that around our program is like man why can't you be more like why can't he be more like his brother or her sister or i think there's comparisons that way like the whole like why can't you be more like and then there's comparisons like the scare tactic way somebody said like you've always got that one uncle right yeah who tried lsd and he's been crazy ever since or whatever yeah. so you can compare that way and especially when you do either one of those i think the obvious response is like i roll the person is going to immediately disqualify everything you say because they're like oh my god like they don't get it they're just such an idiot like mm -hmm. they're just gonna think all right number 10 so these are statements that get made as long as you're not doing drugs in this house or if you if i find drugs in this house i'm calling the cops on you okay you know why I put this on the list, David? I'd love to know. Because this is what families do, especially parents. Once they feel like it's gotten like pretty far and they've lost control, mm -hmm. they'll say something like, well, I better not find it in this house. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. If your kid has an addiction to drugs, they're doing it in your house. <laughs> they have it on them all the time. They're not going these long stints of time, days and nights, like and not doing drugs. So don't lie to yourself and think, well, they're not bringing it in the house. If they're not bringing it in the house, they're probably not an addict. Or we've had some kids and be like, they get told that and they're like, okay. And they have it like literally buried in the backyard mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're standing in the backyard doing it. It's like they're <laughs> loopholing you, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like another form of a scare tactic. Like mm -hmm. if I find drugs in this house, I will have you arrested. And then boy, do you look bad when you do find drugs in the house and not they don't do get arrested. <laughs> you don't call the cops. <laughs> Except our one client, if I find drugs, I'm going to call the cops. It's because most of the time people aren't really prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. And they think if I say that, they're going to know I mean business and they're definitely not going to do that. If you are dealing with an addict or an alcoholic, they are going to do it. They are going to do it in your house. I'm not saying don't call the cops. You can totally call the cops. I'm just saying you don't have to threaten it first because mm -hmm. you might, you might or you might not. Sometimes parents think they would and they would they won't. Yeah. And you don't want to have to go back on that. Right. It's not telling you can. I'm just saying don't put the threat out there. Mm -hmm. So that wraps up the 10. Knowing when to tap out of these conversations. So do you want to explain that a little bit? or? Yeah, like somebody, when we were having this conversation, and you might have been on the porch, but they were talking about how they were in group. And the group did this. And families do this too. But this person is making a decision that the group didn't like. And even in group therapy, the rest of his peers were like on him and on him and there was just nothing he could say that was going to be right and they just kept pressing it and this happens in families a lot it's like you get locked into this argument you keep saying the same thing they keep saying the same thing the whole thing's escalating you got to know when to just step out like yeah there's no winning that conversation you got to know when you've just hit the wall it's not productive and when you feel yourself escalating and you feel them escalating you need to step out immediately because mm -hmm. all you're doing is causing more damage to the relationship and in the end the relationship is the only power that you have to be able to affect any change and so it's like you just gave away all your superpowers when you do that mm -hmm. yeah so know when to hold them know when to fold them that's right